Today is Chai Elo, the 18th day of Elo. It is a huge special day on the Chabad calendar. It is not just Chabad, really for all Hasidim, uh, whether you're a Tversky or a Rappaport, whether you live in Bar Park, Flatbush, uh, all Hasidic Jews um, know this as a special day. It is the birthday of the Baal Shem Tov and the birthday of the Alter Rebbe. Now that might be special on its own, the day that these souls come down to this world. Uh, the Alter Rebbe we know is a new soul, which is very uncommon. Our generations have a soul that never came before, a new soul. Yeah. Baal Shem Tov was a soul that's been here before. Tremendous stories about him that we can look into and read about. But what's amazing also is the Baal Shem Tov, uh, we know, had three extraordinary events in his life, all on the 18th of Elul. First of all, he was born on the 18th of Elul, a uh, very special year, Nachas. Uh, <laughs> then um, it's, the, it's the age when, it's the date, I'm sorry, when Achia Shiloni, Achia Shiloni was a teacher of Elijah the prophet. Elijah's teacher, a prophet that lived 3,000 years ago, came back to teach the Baal Shem Tov. One of the traditions we have, he taught the Baal Shem Tov Torah, and he came back, and that started on his birthday. That went for many years, and we describe it that he started from Barishas, the end of the Torah, being taught by Achir Shalini over a number of years. And then it's also the date that he was encouraged and strongly pushed by those who were also great Sadiqim to reveal his identity to the world. Because until that time, People saw him as a very simple, uh, plain helper for teachers, nice, sweet person. No one knew the depth of his brilliance and his holiness, that from a young child, he would converse with Elijah the prophet, from, that his tremendous wisdom is a Kabbalist. He's, he was an incredible in the person, individual, holy soul, and no one knew until on this day, um, he was pushed, so to speak, against his will to reveal his identity and become the leader and become the teacher of Hasidus of the whole world. And he eventually become the father of all Hasidic movements in the world, come from the Baal Shem Tov. Then, of course, the Alter Rebbe is the path of Hasidus Chabad. And that's the Chabad track, so to speak, of Hasidus. So it's a special day. Um, so Hashem should bless all of us to the light, the power of this day should be um, internalized. We're holding a chapter um, seven. And we're going to go back to the beginning of this section, which is really sort of we're up to, but we're going to really go into it properly today. Uh, the discussion on the very bottom of page, Pei Gimel. We just finished discussing and explaining a deeper understanding of Yehuda Tata. Yehuda Eila means, we said many times, the higher level of unity, there's no world, nothing else exists. Yehuda Tata, this was based on a teaching of the Rambam that God is the knower, the one who knows, meaning the brains and the thing that's known, all in one, something that the mind can't grasp and the heart can't feel, and if you can't hear it, understand it. This idea is the um, understanding of God. There's no God and his knowledge, and the things he knows is all one. That means, this goes back to the statement that says, I am God, didn't change from before creation to after creation, because nothing changed. I was the only one before, I'm the only one now, nothing changed. Nevertheless, at the same exact time, we say Hashem is aware of every blade of grass, every person, every beast, every uh, uh, planet, every solar system, every everything out there, Hashem is aware of it. So the item, the things do exist 100%. There's 100% existence of every single thing in the universe, because Hashem knows about it, Hashem knows real stuff. At the same time, that existence, which is the information God knows, is not outside of himself. That means nothing exists outside of God. Interesting. Today's Tanya, which is a little longer, because Chai Elder it was set up a little bit longer today. One of the lines the Alter Rebbe uses there, and this is talking about this concept, exactly what we're discussing right now. And he said, this is something that I will never be able to understand. No matter how hard you try, I'll ne never be able to grasp this concept, how at the same exact time we can absolutely exist, and at the same time there's nothing outside of God. And that's a concept that if just, we said before, accept it with faith is the truth, because our minds can't really wrap around this concept. We've got to repeat it, we've got to explain it in words, that it's at the same time that we are existing, we don't exist outside of God, there's no other existence. How is that accepted? Hi, good morning. Chag Sameach. So that's what we were saying until now. Now we're going to introduce, and we touched on it last week, but we're going to introduce probably today, the idea of Tzimtzum. Tzimtzum literally means, for our discussion, contraction. Contraction, smaller, condensed, or, or um, I guess condensed is the best word to use. What's interesting is this concept was found in the Zohar already. The idea of Tzimtzum 
was found in the Zohar discussing that Hashem, as He comes down from world to world and level to level, and from the angels to the physical, from the super um, high level of spirituality to the lower level of spirituality, Hashem is constantly condensing His presence, making it much more uh, hard to feel, hard to see, uh, much more <laughs> concealed. But that was all in process. But the Arizal in the late 1500s came out with a novel idea, and he called it Simsum Harishain. The first contraction. He says every other contraction means there was something and now there's less. There was something, now there's less. So the process, you could say, if I want to explain something to a 10 year old, I want to explain to him about uh, the complexities or some of the political issues or some um, dangers of smoking, whatever. Instead of going into the medical issue, I just say it's bad for you, it turns your lungs black. That's an oversimplification, but it's the fact. I Meaning you could always simplify and make it condensed. The higher levels have much more information. You could go academically, you could go based on tests and theories and experiences and pathological tests, etc. But that's all taking something and making it smaller. The Arizal says stage one was a complete concealment, an absolute complete removal of God 100%, God forbid, I have to say that because it's been explained. He said symptom Risha was a complete concealment. Why? The world was filled with God. There was no room for a world. There was no room. It's like trying to take in the center of the sun and create a place that you're going to make some toast. That's not possible without taking the sun away. Could you make a space within there where no sun exists? So I brought here a, a copy of the words of that result, and I'm going to read it and try and explain it. I wanted to bring a printout, but I want to do a lot of things. So uh, um, this is the Arizal's, uh, what he says, and, that, and there's a major argument about what this means. From what I've seen, there's four general opinions, but two real opinions, two real accepted opinions. That is a clash of what he means here. And this, by the way, was one of the main original arguments between the Hasidim and the Mesnagdim, between the opponents of Hasidis. And Hasidis was based on this understanding. The Vilna Goyen had a theory different than the Alter Rebbe. Each one based it on previous teachers they had. And this is a major clash. How do you interpret this teaching of the, of the Rizal? So let's see what the Rizal says. He says as follows. Da, no. Ki terem solem. Before there appeared all those things, usually when you say atzilos or neslu, you mean almost like radiant, that which came from me. Like if I'm very hot and someone says next to me, or radiator is a better example, you can feel the heat coming off the radiator. It's not like there's something there, but you feel the radiant. Before there was any radiance off of God, and before anything was created, there was a simple, undescribable. Pashut here means not simple like this kid's pretty simple. Well, that's a simple outfit. Simple here means no way to describe. Big, small, tall, short, fast, slow, loud, quiet. No description possible. Memali It filled up all existence. There was one thing. God. There was no such a thing called as a space or an air or an empty area. There was no other things there. There was just one thing. All existence was God. Remember, we're using words like space, existence. These things don't exist in that realm. Way before. Way before. This is the first, he's talking about the first stage of creation. It's called Timsum Hevishan. This is the this is the novel teaching of the Arizal over what the Zehar says. Zehar says there was Timsumim all the time. God made contractions. The Arizal of Gloria says in the late 1500s, and this becomes the big discussion. What was this first symptom? He says, There was only God, only this endless light. There was no beginning, no end, no start, no finish. It was just godliness, whatever that means. But when Hashem decided, I want to make creations and to make existence, Hashem says, and we explained why earlier, He wanted something to rule over. He wanted someone that could be, make Him a king. And then at that time, Hashem will suddenly start getting descriptions. Havaya, Adnai, Kael, Adoim, happy, sad, angry, powerful. Until this point, you can't use any description on God. You can't say He's a Kael, you can't say He's uh, Adna, you can't say Shaka, you can't say Elikim. Those are all descriptions. Hashem wanted to have some sort of presence in what Hashem wanted. 
And this is the reason for creation of the world, so Hashem could express Himself into other. Like we explained, and like He says, this is these writings here. Just to remind ourselves, the reason I never wrote anything down. His student Chaim Vital, we're quoting here Eitz Chaim. He is quoting in his writings Eitz Chaim what his master said, and he says, as we wrote before, Anaf means like branch uh, or leaf. Leaf one, um, Chakira, theory one, meaning what we spoke earlier, he's saying what we spoke earlier about that Hashem desired to have existence. And now comes the important part. Hashem contracted himself into a, a, um, a Nakuda, which literally means a dot, means he contracted himself the essence of his light. And he made that light contracted. Again, these are words that have to be discussed. And he made a space where he sort of went around that space. In other words, he made an empty spot. It was like, just to use a very gross analogy, the sun created an empty spot where now it's cool. But you know, it's interesting by the flood. It says, how do they survive on the, in the boat? We have two questions. How do they survive? How do the fish survive? Well, the water was boiling. They should have been poached. They should have been poached people. <laughs> How did they survive? It says Hashem, even though the whole world was boiling water, around the ark, around the teva, it was calm, cool waters. That's where all the fish collected. And that's where, the, uh, so it was the area, I don't know if it was a thousand meters, or 50, I have no idea, but an area around the ark that was like the cool, the rest of the world was chaos. That was cool water. So it says Hashem created an empty spot. This is the big discussion. And that place that Hashem created, it was called a Makayim Pony, the clear space. It was a wipe that you know, the board was full of data. We cleared a small space. And this space was cleared from the rest of Hashem's essence. So that's what he says. And then, and then he goes on to explain that Hashem then took, a, made a kav, what's called a line, a thin, a thin, thin line, and injected into that space a tiny bit of himself. And we talk about Atsilus, Berea, Yitzira, the angels, the heavens, the Akudim, the Kudim, all the levels. That's that thin stream, the thin line of light that God allowed into this empty space. Mm -hmm. So if you want to just take this in a very, like I said, gross, very coarse way to say it, the table was completely covered with a mess. I cleared one spot, and over there I'm going to do something. The whole world was God. Hashem cleared a spot. God free zone. And now, because, imagine, you can't have God and you in the same place. Imagine. I'll get back to this metaphor later, just to mention it now. We'll come back to it soon. Imagine your mind is overwhelmed with some tremendous, tremendous, crazy tragedy. God forbid a loved one's in the hospital with a critical injury. God forbid something massive or even positive. You, you just won a billion dollars in the lottery and you now you have, so you have four million new friends. Wow, exciting. <laughs> All the new friends. So, <laughs> so that's why you're excited. And someone's trying to tell you, I'm just trying to remember the recipe for the honey cake this year. I, my mind can't get there. Why? My mind is completely full. If you can take a deep breath and relax and <coughs> clear your mind, then you could bring up that thought. Meaning Hashem had to make a space that was clear. Okay. And then he says like this, um, Ketaze, this piece and other pieces are taken from the writings of the Rizal. And there are many things that we discussed. This is the, this is the original statement of the Rizal. So there's a lot of problems with this, first of all. Number one, when I say problems, I mean how we interpret it. We can't say, God forbid, that we're talking about spatial space that is the area larger as you know 40 football fields or as large as you know um half of wisconsin and hashem there's no space Hashem does not space <sighs> pardon me so think of an example we started saying this in the past earlier you could say pesach is coming let's get all the hummus out of this room but you can't say pesach is coming let's take all the two times two out of this room equals four two times equal four we got to get rid of the room Get out of the room. Why not? Because it's not a thing that you could take. It's not, it's a theory. It's a spiritual idea. Spiritual ideas don't take a place. They don't have a spot that they take up. So what does this mean that we say he made a space? And of course, we're talking in metaphors. So just to take a step backwards and not to think God's we're talking about an actual space, let's ask a different question. How come I could say that two times two equal four is in my head, not in my elbow? I thought it didn't have a space. My elbow doesn't have that. My head, my brain has it. How can my brain ha it, does it have a space or not? Sometimes we say two times two, it's, you know what? Let's go to Chicago where two times two is seven. 
And it's probably true, by the way, for taxes or something. You know, <laughs> let's go to, you can't, it's, it, no matter where you are, no matter where you, two times two is not limited to a space. It's a concept, it's a theory, it's an idea. So what does it mean that it's in my head? No different than I can put on the blackboard. I can put two times two before on the blackboard. Why? Because that doesn't mean it's there or not. It means where is it revealed? Where is it expressed? So we talk now in all of discussion, we're not talking about, we're talking about, imagine if we're talking about a simple spiritual, limited spirituality, an idea, two times two go four, or E equals MC squared. I have no idea what that means anyway. I just like this uh, line. Um, those ideas are just in the world, are those we could sort of discuss. Imagine God that can't be discussed. How are we saying there was a space and he made it clear and he stuck it in there? So let's retranslate now. When we say he made it clear, it means it wasn't revealed. And when he says it was um, it, it is there, meaning the, sp the space was not cleared, it's revealed. So the definition now of he cleared a space means he made a spot that it was no longer revealed. Like, right now, it's not revealed in my mind, and the equation is about seven times six. But if I stop, I start doing math, I can figure, meaning my mind is clear from all that information, any math questions, any trigonometry. But if I start thinking about it, it could come revealed in my mind. I write it down, it's revealed on the board. I could talk about it revealed in the conversation. But if I'm not discussing it, it doesn't mean it's not here. It's just not revealed. It's not, it's not present. So the definition of clearing a space means Hashem made that it was no longer revealed. It was no longer revealed, um, felt, uh, wasn't being felt in that spot godliness. And that, now we come into the big argument. The argument is when Hashem, when the Arizal says that Hashem cleared a space, does he mean it actually became a space where godliness was not revealed? Godless was truly concealed. Of course, God is there. Conceal means, you know, if I put on a pair of sunglasses like the welders wear, and it's actually really not sunglasses, like complete. You only could see anything once they put the welding light on, and it's it's uh, 10,000 watts. So that you could see through the black and you could see something. And I go outside, I go, wow, it got dark outside. No, it didn't. Your eyes are covered. That's how the Rebbe explains the novelty of not, not seeing God in the world. It's not the presence of God. It's our lack of seeing it. But the lack of concealment is how we're going to use the concept of not here or here. So now here's the question. Here's the big argument. According to the Vilna Goyen and according to the people that he followed and all the uh, theories that he was going with, when God made the Tzimtzum, according to that result, he actually made a place where godless is not seen, or heard, or felt. Godless is not revealed. And the Alter Rebbe says, God forbid to say that. Of course, I know what you mean. They only mean, like, in my mind, it revealed. When God made that space, because why do they say that? What's their logic? What's their theory? And why were they so angry at Chabad, at the Alter Rebbe saying it? He says, you're like saying that the king comes into the, into the bathroom to clean the toilets. For God to be present in this physical world means that God is coming into this physical world and his presence is here. God, God can sit upstairs in his office and, and control him from above. He has to come into the world. Saying God, meaning saying that the God really never cleared a space for the world. And where the world exists, God exists all in one spot, in one challenge, besides the fact that how is it possible to have a world? But that's what we just discussed. So that we could discuss. The reason why I can discuss this now is we just finished discussing how you can have two times at the same exact time that we actually exist, yet we are not outside of God. That we covered sort of until here. But for them, how could you say that God comes down, lets his presence be felt in the most? He said, you can't even go and we're filling in these places. You're saying God's in the bathroom. You're saying God's in the in a, in a barn. You're saying God's in all different places, meaning God's presence is everywhere. It's God is a little, just a little bit less revealed in the world. The Alder says, no, he's 100% revealed. We don't see it, but he's 100% revealed. I like the metaphor of God is one with every single thing in the universe. In other words, God's presence is here 100%. Nothing is hidden. How do you understand it? It's two opposites at the same time. We explained about the Mbakam and Mishkan, how the RN takes up no space, but God's presence was never, ever concealed. And that when we say that God was concealed in this first symptom, it's telling you of how it appeared to us. And the words we use is, do you say symptom kipshote means, you mean, do you mean symptom? Or are you just using it in how it appears to us? So do we say it's Simpson Kipshutai? We got to remember these words because we're going to use it a lot now. Is Simpson Kipshutai? Did Simpson really happen? Did God really hide himself in this little space that he cleared? Whatever that means. Or is God never hid himself anything? God's 100% there as he was before. And the difference only is if we perceive it or not. And we can perceive that truth. Now, why is it so important? One of the reasons why it's so important is one of the philosophies of Hasidus is that every single thing that happens in the universe is. It's called Hashgacha Pratis. Nothing happens randomly. 
not a leaf falling from a tree. The, the Baal Shem once said that when a leaf falls from a tree, not only is that Hashem wanted that random leaf to fall from the tree, but how many times it turns over till it hits the ground uh, is important enough that it will affect the entire creation. It's like that extra dot that you put into a long email address. I put a comma in. Every dot matters. You put a comma, you're not getting to your destination. Every, how many times a leaf turns over matters, meaning it's all part of God's essence. If you believe God is the world and the world is God, meaning nothing's outside of him, then when you spill coffee on your lap and when you miss a bus and when you make an airplane and you, and you get engaged here, whatever happens, this is exactly how it's supposed to happen. God is running every every the weather and the and the and not just the general. You know, other people believed Hashgachah Pratis, God's divine um, guidance means that Hashem in general He makes at the end of the day the Packers shall win. How many plays they're going to do if someone slips and breaks their ankle or not? Who cares? The Packers will win. They won't win. They'll lose. They probably will lose. But all the sorry, but uh, but all these things they say God just has a general plan. He sits in his office. He controls stuff in the general. You think he cares if one ant crosses the road now or not? And the Chassidus says, no, every end, where he is and what he's thinking, how he's feeling, is all part of the master plan. So it changes the whole perspective of the universe. Plus, says the altar, but it's a danger. What you're saying is that God so to remove himself, that is how idol worship started. How did idol worship begin in the universe? Idol worship began in times of, of Anish. People believe that God, God is the only God. But I think God is nothing better to do than to sit and control you know, everybody's uh, things. He's okay. Stars and moons and planets, you're in charge of weather. You, solar system, you're in charge of people's uh, moods. You take care of this. You, and he gave a whole control. To, it's not because Hashem can't do it. Hashem doesn't have to busy himself with these little matters. Eventually, people started saying, one second. He gave it over to the stars. I'm going to pray to the stars. <laughs> Why do I need God? Why should I talk to the king? I'll go to the minister of finance. Not just that. I got a friend in the office. And suddenly people started, that's how idol worship began. People started realizing and thinking. And, they, and the big mistake they made, says the Hasidic teachings, was they thought that the stars, they, Hashem really did give our power to them. But they're like the when you come into the kitchen and you go over to a helper and you say, oh, that cake came out really good is one thing. If you go over to the mixer and say, man, you mix a really good cake. You're offending the chef. What do you think? The mixer made the food? Oh, I want to thank all the plates. The food was delicious. It's not the plates. It's the person. So thanking the moon and the stars means you're forgetting that Hashem empowered them. But like an axe, like it's a pen. Wow, this pen writes really smart poems. <laughs> it's not the pen. So, but the bottom line is how did it start? Because they started saying Hashem gave over power. Hashem never gave over power. Hashem uses the sun, the moon, and the stars. As, and that's why you can look in the stars and see the future. Because Hashem does give over a certain amount of direction through them. But like a, like a tube that make, carries water from place to place or fuel from place to place, the tube doesn't make the fuel. Doesn't, it just it can't do it. The stars and the moon are, can't do it. But Hashem never gave over, over power. Sorry if I'm speaking too fast. Just a lot of thoughts. So I'll slow down. So bottom line is that this is the beginning of idol worship. Of starting to say that Hashem gave over because it was below his dignity. And the Alt Rebbe says are very dangerous things to do. So, because of these points and others, he's, and as we'll see, some very basic points he'll make in the concept itself, we don't want to go there. And this caused a great rift amongst Hasidim and uh, yeah. opponents. Now, what's amazing is most of the people involved didn't know what the fight was about. They were busy, they would put up signs against Chabad, against, you know, uh, against the Baal Shem, against the Alt Rebbe, but they didn't know that the original core issue was a very philosophical issue. This issue lasted about 100 years. <laughs> the Alter Rebbe, when he wrote the Tanya, he wrote this whole chapter into the Tanya. When he had it published, he left out this whole section. Why? So we, we don't know for sure why, but what we know is the Alter Rebbe told his Hasidim, I don't want you gloating. So what happened was when he was arrested and came out of jail, it was sort of seen by everybody, sign from God, that I was right. They put him, they went to the government that said the Alter Rebbe is making, you know, a rebellion. But the real issue was against his, what he, what he said in Tanya, that Hashem, uh, the symptom was not a real symptom. It just appears that way. God, of course, never made a clear space. So when he came out, the Hasidim were like, you see, our Rebbe was right. This is what God wanted. He should continue teaching. And that's what happened. He talked, talked much more. But he said in the published versions of the Tanya, even though he had written the Tanya earlier, he written the Tanya before his arrest, but in the published versions that came out from um, the late, I guess, 1890s, I don't know what year it was exactly, till 1900, they had this chapter kept out, this piece of the chapter, not to sort of continue the fight. This is a rift. We know this. We have to publish it. We don't have to make a, keep the fight on paper. Later, as things became much later, they became much more close to relationships between Chabad and all these other organizations, between later Volozhners and later leaders and all the other 
uh, leaders of the uh, the Mestagish and Lutvish movement, they put it back in. Who put it back in? I don't know, but it was put back in 1900. So only about 100 years ago it was put back in. So about 100 years, it wasn't there. 105 years, it wasn't there. But this is something that came back, and it's it's a it's a very big issue amongst, amongst the Kabbalists and thinkers. It's like a huge, huge issue. Okay, so let's go start this inside, see where we're going with this, and we'll continue uh, explaining. This is from W. Scheinzeltz. I tried to see his way of explaining things because he gives such good metaphors. The problem is this part, his metaphors are hard to understand. You have to know a little bit of science to understand his metaphors rather than he uses, he uses science and physics as metaphors. I'm like, okay, plus it's in Hebrew. So good luck for me. All right. So now that we explained, let's go back inside. Now that we explained that Yechud which is really the key essence of what we're explaining here, the lower awareness includes that Hashem, while we do exist 100%, nevertheless, we don't exist outside of God. That means Hashem is here 100% in every part of creation. Now let's go back and explain and talk about this concept of symptom, if it's really happened or didn't happen, what it means. From here we can understand where that new section, the bottom of the Gimel. Shigigas, the mistake of mixas of some of the sages in their own minds, their own eyes. And he says amazing words here. Hashem Adam, Hashem should forgive them. He says, because we're dealing with something that can be very close to idol worship, God forbid. And who's he referring to in particular, it seems like? He's referring to it seems like Chaim Velazhin. The prime student of the Vilna Goyen, his name was Chaim Velazhin. He wrote a work called Nefesh Chaim. Nefesh HaChayim was like the response of the Litvish, uh, the, the opponents, let's use the word opponents, the opponents of Hasidus needed a book to be, the Tanya was a very powerful book, drawing hundreds and thousands of followers to Hasidus, because it was such a, when we learn in Tanya, you see the little bit we understand how, how incredible it is. And so they needed a book, so to speak, as a response that they have. He was a brilliant, great scholar. His name was Reb Chaim Velazhin. What's interesting is, mm-hmm. he himself personally, actually agree with the Alter Rebbe on the subject. On the subject of of, um, of uh, symptom, he did not agree with his mentor. His mentor and teacher was uh, the Vilna Goyen. Uh, but he himself felt um, a little differently. So his works, even though the work was written as a response to the Alter Rebbe, and it's a response to the Tanya, nevertheless, he personally actually agreed with it. It's interesting. He, had a personal opinion, agreed with the Alter Rebbe. He, and because of that, part of the uh, animosity changed after he took over. It, it, things became a little better. Then his son, I think his name was Itzel Lev I forgot his first name. I think Itzel Lev. He um, even better became good workings with the other, the Tzemach Tzedek. It was, things changed a lot. But the bottom line is, so he's referring, it seems, to that safer of the Nefesh HaChayim. That's what I understand. Hashem um, Adam, Hashem should forgive them. Sheshoggu v'tohu be'yunay be'kisve ha'rizel, be'yunam, kisve ha'rizel. They made a mistake in the in-depth study of that rizel. When they were learning the Arizal, what we just read from the what he quoted here, when we read the Arizal, they took that and they misunderstood it. That's what the Dal Rebbe says. Vehevinu, and they thought, and they think, Inyan had Simpson Hamusk Rasham. This idea of Simpson, the contraction that's mentioned there by the Arizal, is Kipshutoi. They think it means actually that Hashem actually has now a clear space. Again, we don't mean actually like physical space. We give the metaphor of like a, a thought in our mind. Again, we're not God, they're not God forbid saying things that are her, heretical, in other words, her, heretic, or mm-hmm. uh, uh, God forbid idol worship, but they're saying things that could lead to it. So he says they're saying things that God actually mean clear, so to speak, his self, his expressed, his revealed self, which could be felt from some area of pre-creation, which means eventually that this, this is the key words. Rabbi talks about this very much in the next few words here. He says, God forbid to say that God took himself out that God took himself out of this physical world, which means he explained it. What's the ultimate? The ultimate was this, phys- this physical world we are today. God wanted to create this. According to them, God's not really felt or seen here. Everything we see here is an expression of God much disconnected from himself. For example, I'll give you just a very big difference between the Hasidus and the uh, opponent's view about godliness. One of the fundamentals that we have as Hasidic view on life is that neshama 
is a chilek eleka mimal mamash, an actual piece of God. They don't say that. No, what do you mean it's a piece of God? Hashem gives you life. Hashem gives you a soul. You think Hashem, they don't believe. They, they say to say Hashem put inside you an actual part of God, a uh, chilek eleka, which is second second chapter is nine, the godly soul. They say it doesn't mean an actual part of God. It means Hashem put inside you a powerful thing to keep you alive, a soul. But to actually Hashem put himself inside you? You can't say that. Hashem Hashem doesn't come down. You think Hashem is going to come and sit around, you know, so close to all the garbage and all the, you know, the bathrooms? That's the metaphor they use because they, they bring the example that you're not allowed to even daven in a room where there's a dirty diaper sitting on the floor or a smell or, or a dog comes in. You know, and that, we have special exceptions. Someone has a dog for medical reasons, we allow it. But usually you can't bring a dog into a shul because it's a dog is not a, not a clean, any animal really, but you can't bring it to the shul. But um, Hashem's going to come into the room. Hashem's going to come with a, Hashem sends, he's, he's watching from above, you know. They say Hashem is, he looks from above and watches you. There's a certain space they put and, and, and they don't mean it, God forbid, a disconnect, but that Hashem's essence isn't here. Rak they believe that Hashem is watching from above. That Hashem is sort of watching and guiding from above everything and guiding all the things that are going on. Okay, you go here, you go here. Hashem is sort of upstairs in the upper management position, to put it a little bit blunt. Al kol hayitzur all created beings, kulam Hashem b'shemayim and that's and that's what that's what they believe. This is the point that Rebbe makes that they have this belief, and now that we understand the Rama that we just read, that Hashem is hu hayudeya, hu amad hu yadua, it's not a problem to have both truths at the same time. That God's presence is here 100%. In other words, nothing exists outside of God. Everything you see is godliness. Nevertheless, it's 100% here. How could they have both at the same time? You know the old joke with the, you're right, you're right, you're right too. <laughs> you know, the rabbi says to the first person, you're right. Second person, you're right. And they're arguing. He says, how could you both be right? You're also right. Everyone's right. How could you all be right? Because Hashem, it's not a contradiction. Like the metaphor we use of the Aaron, the uh, Holy Ark, did not take up his place. It took up place. It was a space that didn't exist in the physical limitations. And now the Alter Rebbe is going to go and explain why. He didn't yet say why. Now he's going to say why. Just to understand, again, just to make it clear, what is the positions that are, the differences here? According to the, the Vilna Goyen and the Gra and all those who he follows and those who followed him, the Simpson Harishan, that first Simpson that the Arizal innovates, that was that first age of creation, was an actual concealment of godliness. Not removal. God, no one says God was removed because God is everywhere, but it's a concealment. God is not expressed, God's not revealed, God's not felt. The Alter Rebbe says absolutely not. God is 100% revealed, 100% expressed, and 100% felt. The reason we don't see it is a problem with us. It's like if God forbid someone doesn't have the, the ability to hear, and he says, oh, I guess that person isn't speaking without sound. God forbid the person speaking, you don't hear it. Meaning the fact that that person, meaning that the expression of God in this space was never a change. Now, what actually happened by that symptom, that is, I guess, we'll go and discuss now. But according to the Alter Rebbe, there never was an actual concealment of God in any way, shape, or form. And Hashem's presence is 100% revealed now. And our job is, during our lifetime, is to reveal that truth. Reveal the truth that this cup of tea was made to make the class to go smoother. This uh, table was made, to, meaning everything is part of that master um, revelation of godliness. And then the Alter Rebbe says as follows. He says, you can't, one of the 13, at one of the 13 foundations of Jewish faith, from it's called the 13 principles of faith from the Rambam is that you can't what's the not a spy you can't um uh put on God for the word for it you can't put on Hashem any physical restrictions of a body by saying by saying Hashem has a body in any way shape or form he has arms and legs and this Hashem even though we find Psukim it says a finger of God the hand of God God's wrath God has no attributes no attributes of a physical body to God by saying that Hashem revealed, like the metaphor we used, like we said, if you have in your mind revealed two times two equal four, or or concealed, you're basically using something of some sort of space, even though you don't mean space, like moving from here to here. But you do mean that there's a place, there's some sort of theoretical space where God has um, Himself present, 
and the fear of the space was not present, it means in some way God has a physical attribute. You can't say that. He said to say that God has a space that's cleared is not possible to say about God. God has no form whatsoever. So you cannot use, you cannot say that reason I meant it literally. The statement does not make sense on God. Any more than it makes sense to say that I took two times two and I moved it from this chair to that chair. It doesn't make sense. You can't say it because only minds could have it, you know, certain things that can express it. On God, you can't use a metaphor, an expression of anything related to space. So why God requests you to build by something? So, so this is again, the, what? A physical dwelling. Right. So this is, so we went into this. Eyes. So first of all, why Hashem wanted, I don't know. Why Hashem wanted that? It's like Hashem wanted in the Holy of Holies an image. God said, don't make an image. And in the Holy of Holies, he has these images. You know, I, when Hashem wanted certain things, you know, I don't know. But the but concept of explaining Hasidus is that I, what I saw is that this is the way to reveal Hashem's presence here to us. When we say Hashem's, we ask the question, remember, in chapter 52 in Tanya, how could Hashem, you say Hashem is in the base of Mikdash? Hashem is everywhere. Hashem is as much in this cup as the base of Mikdash. What do you think? That he's more there? And then he like sort of, he slid out of the space and he, he keeps himself there? It means where could we sense and where is the world affected by it? I mean, we have a disconnect from godliness because we have what's called klipa, shells, concealment. Well, our job is, where is the shells less? Where is the less concealment? So Hashem's presence is everywhere. But like we said, the story of the Rebbe Rashab on the last Purim of his life, before he passed away, he was going to show us chassidim, how a silver cup was actually godliness. And then he, and the Fidu Rebbe says, went to get the cup, and he was shaking when he brought it. He's going to be the Rebbe himself in a few weeks, but he was shaking. And the Rebbe Rashab said, forget it, he's not going to do it. Why won't you show them? Because the chassidim are going to think this cup was different. We think Eretz Yisrael is different, and the Beis Hamikdash is different. And truth to be told, you could do, you could make here Eretz Yisrael. What does that mean? The truth is that all every God's everywhere. Hashem has places which revealed, so we can connect easier to it and relate to it. And it's sort of it's the way Hashem communicates with us. But the truth to be told, there's no more godliness in the Beis Hamikdash than there is in your tool room, except one place is it's revealed. And we gave all the metaphors you remember of Torah and how Hashem transmits, etc. But truth is, Hashem is equally everywhere. You can't, to say God, that's exactly the point. To say God is less in the tool room than he is in the Beis HaMikdash, that's what they're saying. They're saying the logical thing is that Hashem cleared his space. He's not gonna, I understand that in the heavenly world, by the angels, Hashem gets involved with them, you know, it's closer. Hashem, the distance between him and an uh, uh, anthill, the distance between God and the angels in, the, in Bria, is the same distance. It's not like they're closer. Number one and the number of 400 trillion is the same distance from infinity. You can't say one's closer because when you deal with unlimited numbers, then 400 trillion is a much bigger number. But with infinity, they're both equally distance. If you go in a circle, if you went around the circle 4,000 times, you can't say, oh, we're getting closer to the end. You can go down another billion times, no closer. You can't, it's infinite, it has no closeness or further. So, um, that. But the bottom line is that Hashem's presence is, oh yeah, so Hashem's presence in the physical world, is, the, according to Chassidus, is no less of an insult, or sorry, no more of an insult than Hashem's presence among the angels. If you think Hashem has to be, it's more shameful Hashem to come into the physical world and sit with you when you're eating chicken, and you're having chicken wings, or you're doing something, and for Hashem that's really uh, uncomfortable to be there, it's equally uncomfortable to be in the place where there's angels. They're both equally distant from Him. So Hashem in general is in the state where what makes him uncomfortable is when we do things to offend him, to bother him, because he went and created his whole process for us. And he made that he cares. He created, like you see a, a student that you might have in your class, a kid that thinks very cute. You will make that you care about the kid's picture, your grandchild, whatever. And then they could hurt you, not because really it matters what a three-year-old says, but because in your mind, this kid is important and valuable. His pictures that he draws matters. If they write something about you that's hurtful, that will hurt you. Because you made Hashem gave us a connection to him. He picked us up and he held us close to him. And now what we do could be offensive and could be hurtful. But not because naturally we have any ability to affect Hashem's feelings. <sighs> so just to conclude here. So the first point he makes is that to say that Hashem has any attribute of clearing a space in any way, however you want to use a metaphor for it, for the ideas, for theoretical stuff, for concepts, Automatically, attrib you're attributing to that's the word I'm looking for. You're attributing to God this um, uh, uh, transgression that the, the Rambam says 
God cannot be attributed to any shape of a, of a person, of any created being. And I'll stop another line here. She efsher klal lemer inyanat simsim kim shodai. Before it's forbidden, sorry, sorry, it's impossible to say the idea of an actual symptom, actual contraction. She mikri ha guf al kadosh baruch hu. That is shavu mikri ha guf, which is one of the things you find about a body, a being, a created being. You could attribute they got smaller, bigger, faster. Um, and you see, in order to say something bigger and smaller or less, you have to have the concept of volume. Volume is a is a way we measure things. You can't use in any way volume by Hashem. Not front, back, side, tall, weight, mass, volume. And therefore, there's no way to explain or attribute to Hashem the word um, he condensed himself. So he said the, the, the word was never meant literally. That Hashem is so distant from any concept of human being. It's like the same way, just to explain it. If you think it's a stretch to say that I explained to this, I use a cup of tea a lot. I, like them. I explained to my cup of tea today a very interesting idea in physics. <laughs> the cup of tea will never understand physics, at least not in our knowledge of uh, cups of teas. The distance between that is nothing with two creative beings having a conversation or one side of conversation. Attributing any of that to Hashem's uh, wisdom or sense or self, how that to say that, like um, the Alder Rebbe uses an expression, I don't know if we got to it yet, or we, we're going to get to it soon, I can't remember, that to say that as idea is so good that I can't hold it in my hand, it's too heavy, is a foolish statement. To attribute these words, they don't fit in the lexicon and the conversations of Hashem. To say Hashem has space where he moved and condensed himself, you can't use those descriptions in any way to Hashem. And certainly we're talking about the earliest ages of creation, the first age, that's not, a, not possible. He says, remember when we're discussing the ideas of Hasidus and we're talking about God, there's no circle, there's no line, but we want to have try and find the, how the Kabbalists found words to describe it, that we can sort of relate to the idea that Hashem cleared a space, and now it's Kav, okay, but the Kav in the thin line, but this is just, um, again, it's uh, easier to talk about than last week's class, because it's sort of, at least we could, we have to say we just have faith. Last week we had to say, it's impossible to describe, there really is, that the same exact time, you 100% exist, at the same exact time, nothing outside of God. Say so you have to have faith. This, this is the reality because you can't picture it. But here, at least we can start understanding some of the description of what he means by symptom is not kipshut. I want to have a healthy, happy, sweet new year. And we'll, um, God willing, reconvene next Wednesday. No one gets engaged. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Baruch Hashem. One wedding at a time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Just a quick. Yeah. So, with what you were saying, with Hashem's presence being a hundred percent everywhere. Yeah. And that um, an equal amount in the base of Mikdash, or an equal amount is shul, as opposed to everywhere else. The difference is, um, in some place, it's more revealed in, than others, but in a way. And then also saying that it's revealed is basically what we recognize, that it's always there. The limitation is on our side of what we see it. So if isn't that part of our role in this world to reveal godliness, which basically means opening our own eyes to seeing that godliness that's already there and recognizing that it just has, as Shem said, build a base of and I will dwell within them. Hashem is dwelling within us. And when we transform ourselves and recognize Hashem within ourselves, we're serving our purpose. Yeah, so there's two, first of all, you're 100% correct. There's two parts. One is our awareness that even though we can't see it, it's 100% godliness and all holy. And the world is a holy place despite the fact that we can't see it. But the part you're referring to is our job, for example. We take a pair of fillings. And you take a challah and you take a uh, chicken wing. Those three things have three different levels of godliness revealed. A trillin, you act differently in front of it and how you treat it because it's holy. I mean, it started off as a skin of a cow and some ink and some uh, parchment, whatever it was, but you made it into something holy by revealing its purpose and transforming it. A challah, you can't say it's holy, but it has a meaningful purpose. It's part of the Shabbos experience. So there already, the holiness is starting to be revealed, even though you don't have to kiss it if it falls on the floor. You don't have to like, uh, you know, treat it differently, put it in Seamus. You can feed it to the birds if you don't use it. But it has already some revelation of its purpose. A chicken wing, 
looks like any other chicken wing, has nothing holy to it except you make a brach on it, you share with a friend, you can make it holy. In other words, we have to reveal that truth, that role, that truth of the world, that it's godliness, has to be uh, um, done through our service, either by becoming aware of Hashem's presence, um, 100%, and the way we conduct ourselves, act, etc., and the more practically is changing the world around us, making a bracha on some food, turning his leather into tefillin, you know, turning bread into challah Friday night, turning um, uh, you know, whatever you, whatever we do. Our what happens is the more you do that, the more the world becomes revealed. Its holiness becomes. You go into a place where the mitzvah is being done constantly. When people are studying Torah, you walk into a room, a shul. You walk into a Shabbos table Friday night. You feel some more kedusha, not because it's really there more, but it's revealed. So our job is to constantly reveal the truth, reveal that which is not seen. At some places, it's supposed to be concealed. You're not supposed to take a pair of fill into a bathroom. You're not supposed to take, um, say, Shema in a barn, you know, with his animals. But it doesn't mean you have to get rid of the barn. By not going into the barn, not saying Shema knowingly, you elevated the barn. It's like the, when you don't put a mezuzah up in the bathroom, you elevate that door. Now it was correctly done. I didn't put a mezuzah there. So everything has ways. Some we elevate by engaging, some by disengaging. But the bottom line is, all that is part of revealing the truth. When someone does that completely in a room, or a shul, or a house, or a yeshiva, or, or a street, or a block, this is making the world the place for Hashem, revealing God's presence everywhere. But yeah, this is this is our avodah. This is this is our avoda to reveal this truth. You know, to simplify it, somebody once quoted the Rebbe in a very simplified way, Hashem is playing, playing a game of hide and seek. Hashem hides and we seek. Our job is not to give up. <laughs> All right. We'll see you. Have a nice week. Thank you. You're very welcome.